All right, good morning. Welcome to day two of the NACFC. Thank you for joining us so early this morning. <laughs> and also, thank you for joining us online. I'm Kim Villari, and this is Don, Don Sealhorse, and we um, are doing Seeing More Than CF 2.0. We had such a good time with it last year. We wanted to bring it back again this year. We've got some great speakers today, so we're going to go ahead and get started. This session will provide information on how the respiratory care of cystic fibrosis patients can be impacted by comorbidities such as asthma, BPD, ABPA, chronic cavitary aspergillosis, mycytoma, as well as social factors. Each presentation will be built around one of the above comorbidities. There will be discussions regarding risk factors, treatment strategies, resources, and disease prevention and health promotion efforts for people with cystic fibrosis. Our objectives this morning, understand how disease comorbidities impact the respiratory care of people with cystic fibrosis, describe how social determinants can impact the care of children with cystic fibrosis, and to discuss risk factors, treatment strategies, resources, and disease prevention, <clears throat> excuse me, health promotion efforts for people with cystic fibrosis. All right, good morning. As Kim said, I'm Dawn Selhorst. I work at Nemours Children's Hospital in Wilmington, Delaware. I have the pleasure of introducing our first speaker this morning, um, Martina Compton, who is a registered respiratory therapist, a registered pulmonary function technologist at University of Virginia Health. She's dedicated to serving the CF community for both in and out of the healthcare system. She has over 40 years of experience as a respiratory therapist with at least the last 20 in the CF population at UVA. She's an avid supporter of the CF Foundation and participates in countless awareness and fundraising events to include the extreme hike for the last nine years. She also enjoys hiking with her dog Tiller and teaching yoga and Martinez retiring in six days. So with that, I would like to welcome you up. Good morning, everyone. Um, can you hear me okay? Thank you, to, uh, Don and Kim, for inviting me to speak and give this case presentation. Ooh, my nervousness just escalated a beat. Um, um, so I have no disposal. And I'm going to be talking about the role of thoracic surgery for managing complex cavitary bronchiectasis and cystic fibrosis. Um, and this patient, Reed, is a 21-year-old female. Um, she has ABPA, chronic cavitary aspergillosis, eosinophilic of asthma, pancreatic insufficiency. And her FEV1 baseline is really good at 112%. Thank you. Um, and just uh, to say a little more on the personal note, I guess she, I've known her probably a little more than half her life. Um, and she has been a very good advocate for herself. She's really good about her care. Um, and just She's just pretty, pretty awesome patient. And these are her current medications. She is on, sorry, uh, ETI, uh, azithromycin, um, and she's taking the, the usual nebulized treatments in her vest. She uses the vest, and she does all that once a day, um, and also the budesonide for Motorola. Um, so this is her x-ray. Prior to her admission, um, about five months ahead of time. So she did have bronchiectasis and that right upper lobe cavitation, but no evidence of pleural effusion or pneumothorax. Um, as I said, doing once daily treatments. Um, her chest CT prior to admission, you can see those um, dilated airways pretty well in that upper lobe. And then um, we saw her in last October for a regular visit, and she came in and was in an exacerbation. Her um, 
lung function at the time was down to 90, I'm sorry, 104% from the 112. And we wanted to start antibiotics, but she did not want to do that. And she wanted to just up her treatment regimen and do two sets a day um, to try to get over this because it wasn't, you know, she wasn't down too far. Um, she was in nursing school at the time, so we were really hoping that she could do that with her busyness. Um, um, and then about a month after that, we did a bronchoscopy. Of course, I didn't do it. Um, and it showed the heavy secretions in the right upper and right lower lobe consistent with the CT um, and the severe bronchiectasis. Her BAL showed the heavy aspergillus fumigatus, um, but there were no other pathogens or bacteria. She's been growing aspergillus since about uh, 2018, and she really doesn't grow anything else. And her mucus is um, yellow, green to tan. So we started her that day um, on Ampitericin B. We had been trying to get Dupixent for her, but were unable to do that. Um, couldn't get it approved. So just the Ampitericin B, um, continue with the two treatments sessions a day. And prednisone was started. And she came back in early December for another visit, and um, she had gotten her FEV1 back up to baseline. She had started the amphotericin B, but hadn't done very much um, tapering the prednisone, and we asked her to come to clinic in two months. And then two weeks after that, she was positive for COVID-19. So we treated that with the trelovir, ritonavir, and adjusted the ETI accordingly. Um, and then a month later, she returned to clinic. This was in January. Um, she had called saying, she, you know, she was having these symptoms of sharp pain in her chest and tightness and in her back and shortness of breath. So our nurse coordinator has her had her come in to clinic for the next day and saw her NP since her doctor wasn't available. Um, she was very short of breath, but she, she looked good. Um, same sputum, not a lot of it, mostly dry, and just really exhausted. Her vital signs when she got there were, were good. Her, um, we did do a spirometry, and her FEV1 was down to 92% now from her baseline of 112. So we did an assessment. So as I said, she looked great. Um, she was coughing a lot, and her breast sound, she was wheezing with crackles and diminished air movement in that right side. So we uh, sent her for an x-ray. Can y'all hear me? Okay. Um, and this is the x-ray that came back um, with a right apical pneumothorax. Um, sorry. So uh, we had to take her to the ED. Our nurse walked her over there and they did chest tooth placement. So just think about this girl. She's 21 years old and no one is with her. She's in the ED by herself. Um, and our nurse couldn't stay with her. And, you know, it was, it was really hard on her. I have a, she gave me a lot of, um, of her view of this story to tell. So I'll just be interjecting some of that while I'm, while I'm speaking. Um, but she said the, the nurse there was very nice and held her hand. They called her mother. She had to come from about an hour and a half to two hours away, but she made it in time to be there for the chest tube placement, which she said was very painful. I saw her the next day in her hospital room. Um, her parents were both there. She was sitting up, smiling, um, but you could tell she was in pain. Her, her, she's always a, a soft-spoken young lady, and um, her tiny little bird voice um, telling me that she was fine. Um, and she did tell me that day that she had an interview for a nursing position. Um, so here she is with, you know, chest tube and um, in pain, and she's going to interview for a, a nursing job when she graduates in the spring. So she's pretty awesome, pretty resilient. 
Here's a chesty tea that day. Um, you can see the persistent moderate hydrogen pneumothorax. Um, pleural fluid is increased. Um, no loculation, though. And then her blood work, her absolute eosinophil count was, was way up. Her IgE was up. And the sputum culture showed the aspergillus fumigatus, and that was all. Um, Fungitel and aspergillus antigen were normal. So we started treatment um, with broad spectrum antibiotics. Um, previously, they had just talked about trying the voriconazole, but they didn't want to decrease her ETI dose. Um, because it potentiates the ETI, but they started that that day and held the ETI um, and then some of her usual medications, but they held the hypertonic saline um, and increased the albuterol. And I, I, she wasn't getting a whole lot of um, airway clearance at the time, um, just mostly deep breathing and coughing and maybe some fairly gentle chest PT on the left side. Um, and this is one week after treatment, no, no real improvement here. Her pneumothorax was increasing, and so was the consolidation and effusion. They had a concern for bronchopleural fistula. She had three chest tubes. I'm not, she told me three. I'm not sure they were all in at the same time, but she had three chest tube placements during this time trying to get it to, to improve, but it just wasn't happening. Um, she said by the third one, she was just so frightened and trembling. I mean, this, this girl went from seemingly very, very healthy, going to college, working to, to this. So that was, that was really difficult for her. Um, so her perspective at this point, um, she said, I never thought I would be going through such a big surgery at this stage in my life. However, I was confident with Dr. Alvin's recommendations for me to undergo the surgery. This is the adult um, CF doctor. I'm sorry, I forgot to, to mention this part. So that day that she went to the ED, our nurse practitioner called our adult doctor, Dr. Alvin, and um, asked her if she could take over this case because she was going to have to be treated in the, the adult um, part of the hospital. And she agreed to do that. And she was down in the ED when she got her chest too. Um, she uh, and she also, Dr. Albin also visited her bedside every day that she was in the hospital. She made sure that she was informed of her plan of care. She instilled a fight in me and always showed me compassion. I always count on her coming by no matter how crazy of a day I had. She treated me like family. So at this point, they decided um, surgical intervention was in order. And they started her, well, they may have already started her back on the prednisone. They continued the low-dose prednisone and continued with the albuterol and the Dornase and, and held the hypertonic saline. Um, she also got a PICC line. Um, and the plan for, um, I, I don't do inpatient stuff, but the plan for, during the procedure with general anesthesia was a low IDE ratio, low respiratory rate to avoid auto peep, avoid hyperventilation and high tidal volumes. Um, and then post-surgery, um, head of the bed elevated and ambulate early. Um, surgical intervention. So this was February 2nd. Um, so she had the lobectomy the lymph node dissection, and she had to have a right total pleural decortication of the empyema. And this means um, that there was an excision of that thick fibrinous peel from the pleural surface, which sounds awful. Um, and that kind of permits the expansion of that underlying um, parenchyma. So the perioperative diagnosis was right upper lobe aspergillus pneumonia, in the setting of cystic fibrosis with bronchopleural fistula and pyema. Uh, another scary <laughs> slide. So this is uh, interoperative findings. 
So, of course, they had saw copious amounts of purulent secretion, excuse me. As expected, it was incredibly difficult dissection with enlarged, torturous bronchial arteries encasing the right pulmonary artery and right upper lobe bronchus. Very thickened and edematous tissue, large reactive nodes throughout the hilum, and the dissection took two hours longer than a typical lobectomy. And then the bronchial stump was hermetic to airway pressure of 25, which just means that it was sealed well um, against pressure. And um, an incidental note was made of numerous enlarged lymph nodes, stage two empyema with fibro fibrinopurulent deposits throughout the right chest requiring total pulmonary decortication. So, post-op care, um, she recovered really quickly. Um, so they had, they were able to stop the prednisone pretty quick. Her, her AECs were normal. Um, they continued the IV, piperacillin and tazobactam for another two weeks post-surgery, including the boriconazole. And they started slowly um, bringing the ETI back in. That started um, the day before surgery. She had a dose, and then eventually she got to where she was taking a morning dose of that, of the ETI, and continuing on the boriconazole. They stopped the budesonide post-op, and she was getting neuron for pain. And her point of view here... Um, was that she didn't remember much about that day, um, but she does remember the first time getting up to walk the halls post-op. The physical therapists were awesome. Um, they are what got her back on her feet. She said it was a real challenge. She was in pain, exhausted, and felt faint as she tried to walk, but she did it. She was so proud of herself. Um, she was only in the ICU one more day, one day um, and she was she liked to tell me all about all the tubes that she had. <laughs> she had... Uh, two more chest tubes at that point, two JP drains, Foley catheter, epidural, and she just couldn't believe she ended up having five chest tubes placed over that 28 days that she was in the hospital. So, um, so post-surgery, as I said, she recovered well. Um, she was able to, with PT, after she was discharged also, she regained full mobility of that right shoulder. Um, I was able to return to work and graduate from nursing school. Um, all of her symptoms resolved. EKG normal, LFTs normal, AEC normal, and all the cultures were negative for any additional organisms. Aspergillus negative, no evidence of recurrent fungal disease at all. Um, so after you have a procedure like this, um, and she was discharged 10 days afterward after the procedure, and then six weeks after that, we waited to do a pulmonary function test, which drives me crazy, but that's what you have to do. Um, and she, her, her, the last one that she had was 82%, which was great. Um, and that's expected to, to continue to improve. So we saw her last in June, um, and these are her posts images. So pretty amazing. Um, no more bronchiectasis there. Um, and that's expected to continue to expand into that right upper lobe space um, in time and her lung function will continue and improve also. Um, so she did pass her boards, she got her job. Um, and because that's why we haven't seen her since June, because she moved to another state um, and she's doing very well. Um, she went to her sister's wedding. So, you know, very happy ending. She continued um, on, we, we got her approved for a new Cala at this, eventually during this course. Um, and she continued on the VORI with the morning dose of Trikafta and then her usual treatments. And she was starting to do um, her vest when I saw her that last day. Um, not for very long. <laughs> she was working up to it, but she knew she wasn't going to have anybody to do chest PT any longer. And she did do the active cycle of breathing, but um, she really wanted to get back to the vest. Um, so I think it's a little, a little quicker. 
Um, so, um, so the reason why I chose this case, it, it is very interesting to me, and I did learn some some stuff about drug interactions, and um, but I just she is just so fierce, um, this sweet girl, um, and she just amazed me. Um, I asked her. Now, the last day I saw her, was she planning on going to NP school at any point? Because I, I just feel like that's what nurses do. Um, but not all of them. I, I know you, Lauren. Um, not our nurse practitioner. Our, our nurse coordinator is not. Um, and she just looked at me quizzically. Oh, I, I just want to be a nurse. And I just want to help people like they helped me. Oh. Thank you guys so much. <laughs> If anybody has any questions, feel free to either come up to one of the standing microphones or you can put them in the app. I do have a question, uh -huh. Tina. Um, does your care team have conversations with any of your people with CF regarding uh, working in a healthcare environment with direct patient contact? Uh, yes, I believe we do. <laughs> yeah, so she knows the risks and, okay. She's an OB. Okay. <laughs> um, my question is, how did she get the aspergillus? Like, where did, I mean, I know it's a fungus, but how, does she know how she got it or? No, uh, I was wondering, like, she was, she had it in 2018. Like, I don't know what that course was immediately after that. I did not investigate that. Um, and that doctor's not here, but, um, Maybe is there some other treatment we could have done? No, I th I think forty percent of our patients have aspergillus in Virginia. We we check everybody for fungal cultures. Is Virginia is humid? Is uh, woody? We have woods in the backyard, <laughs> so uh, it's very very prevalent. Okay, thank you, thank you, Dana. And that's Dr. Alban. Um, I have another question. Does she require any pulmonary rehab after all that? She did not. She got PT, um, and she was very happy with the treatment she got with the respiratory therapist. They were great with her. Um, they kind of let her drive what was happening while she was in the hospital, and that's important for, for her. Any other questions? Anybody have any other questions? All right. Thank you, Martina. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jamie Duckers, Dr. Jamie Duckers, excuse me. He is a doctor at Cardiff and Vail University Health Board of the UK. Jamie qualified from the University of Wales College of Medicine in 2000 and was appointed as a consultant respiratory physician in 2009 at Cardiff and Vail University Health Board. He is the research lead for the All Wales Adult Cystic Fibrosis Service Health and Care Research Wales Respiratory Specialty Lead and National and National Clinical Lead for Rare Diseases in Wales. Jamie is the chair of the UK CF Registry and sits on the British Thoracic Society Specialist Advisory Group, Cystic Fibrosis, and he leads the Cardiff and Vale University Bronchiectasis Service and is an honorary lecturer at Cardiff University. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, thanks, Kim. Thanks, Dawn. Thanks, everyone organizing it to ask us over, actually. Um, I love this topic because we're seeing more than CF every day in clinic. Um, and I'm going to talk about CF asthma overlap syndrome, which I have to confess, I find really difficult. So if you can help me out with it, that would be great. But we are seeing more of it. Uh, so I'm going to... Uh, don't have any disclosures that are relevant to this. But I do have a disclosure in that I have a teenage daughter who's doing English literature and did the same thing I did. Didn't read the book, watched every film. So we've had a lot of Romeo and Juliet in our house. Uh, 
and it leads me to think what is in a name that which we call a cough or wheeze by any other name so these are all labels aren't they that people have cough and wheeze and what is cystic fibrosis and what is asthma is very difficult to tease out sometimes so she's watched a few of these films and if we go back to the first colour films of Romeo and Juliet in the sort of 60s you can see that actually for cystic fibrosis there weren't a whole range of treatments and then on the top you can see the arrow is the treatments available for asthma not huge amounts for either and then you go across to her favourite film with old Leo in it um, and you can see that the progress in cystic fibrosis has been quite impressive look at all the new drugs coming through in asthma they've got a couple of inhalers um, and then if we go to the Romeo and Juliet of today we're really in personalized medicines aren't we look at what we've got for cystic fibrosis but actually in the asthma arena things have changed as well there are lots of new treatments available for asthma as well so what do we know so far about CF over asthma overlap we know that the symptoms overlap we know it's really difficult to diagnose and we know that wheeze is really common. So here you can see that almost two thirds of children with CF actually have wheezing. Um, Dawn helped me out with some prevalence from the uh, US registry. So almost a third of people in the US registry are listed as having asthma. And actually, interestingly, the same in the UK CF registry. So 31.5% of people actually have uh, asthma documented. If you compare this to the prevalence in the US of having asthma, 7.7%. So it appears much more common in CF. And it actually has a huge burden of care for our people. So I took these figures from the, the UK registry. And you can see so many people are on bronchodilators and lots of people are inhaled corticosteroids or combinations of inhaled corticosteroids. So I thought I'd illustrate uh, some of the problems that we have with a case. So this is Shelley, and this is her own artwork. Um, so she's 18. She's Delta F508 homozygous. She's pancreatic insufficient and colonized with pseudomonas. She's got a history of having nasal polyps. She has got a, a hay fever and eczema, and there's a strong family history uh, of asthma. Um, she's part-time studying, part-time working in a pizza restaurant. She's on lots of medications that are very familiar to everyone. So a short acting beta agonist. She's got Trikafta, Creon, uh, DNA's hypertonic saline and her inhaled anti-pseudomonals. Um, she does have an aerobica. How much she uses it, I'm not sure. She doesn't do any formal exercise and she doesn't have a huge clearance of sputum per day. As I said, she's very variably adherent uh, with her medications and her airways clearance techniques. She doesn't smoke or vape. Um, she has a baseline FEV1 of nearly 90%. Her sweat chloride, does, uh, which we do annually actually, is 116. So when she is taking ETI therapy, she's probably down in the 70s. So we know there is a, a little bit of an issue with adherence. And some of that is driven about concerns with weight. So her BMI is 28. Now Shelley lives um, around three or four hours from our center. Uh, and she presented to her local hospital with shortness of breath, wheeze, especially at night and a cough. Uh, and when I talked to her afterwards, she does describe this as being slightly different to her normal exacerbation. And some of the results that she had at her local hospital, so she's got a CRP infection marker of less than five, so uh, low. Her subsequent viral throat swab was negative. Sputum didn't grow any pathogens. She was slightly hypoxic when she was seen there. Her chest x-ray was normal. They went on to do a CTPA because they were concerned could she had a pulmonary embolus. It, it showed minimal airway dilatation and some mucus plugging. Uh, and they did her lung function. It was very slightly down on her baseline. So actually, just she just started almost as a reflex, started IV antibiotics there without huge improvement, actually. And then when they went back to look at the differential of her blood count, she had an eosinophilia. They went on to do uh, a pheno, so an exhaled nitric oxide. So that was elevated. Um, her fungal markers actually are aspergillus IgG and rastroaspergillus were fine. Her total IG was slightly elevated. And at this point, they started on oral steroids and inhaled corticosteroids, thinking obviously there is an eosinophilic drive here. It's not her normal presentation. 
and she did really well. So in a nutshell, diagnosing CF asthma overlap syndrome, there isn't a gold standard way of diagnosing this. There are clues in the history. So if you think for Shelley's history, she herself was saying, this isn't quite like my normal exacerbation. And I know we're all learning, aren't we, post cafeteria of what, what normal CF is. She also has a strong history, history, family history of asthma. She's got history herself of eczema, history of hay fever. So all of these may point to a little bit of A to P that we're thinking about. We didn't demonstrate any reversibility on her airflow. We did look at the A to P and she's got a high eosinophil account. Her total IgE is elevated. And interestingly, she didn't really respond to the antibiotics. She did respond to the steroids. So these are some of the things that might make you think, is that this an element of CF asthma overlap syndrome? There's actually a really nice paper here that I've, I've listed that is from a couple of years ago, is really looking at this area. And I do believe this area is emerging. Um, so what you can see is there's so much overlap in the symptoms. Perhaps some of the clues we talked about were triggers. Are there things that trigger? So drugs, uh, air quality, things at work, fungus. Um, and is there a history of A to P? And is there a significant family history? So these may be some things that you might be thinking, this is slightly different to just CF. Um, and then if we have a look at some of the objective measures, so for what we're looking for is some airways obstruction, isn't it? And the classic thing for asthma is that you'll have daily variability. So she was talking about at night, we didn't do any peak flows with her at this point, but she is talking about a difference at time. You sometimes see that in cystic fibrosis, but the clue with asthma will be there's excessive variability. In this case, we, often, we haven't actually done any formal bronchodilator uh, reversibility. But that is one thing that you could look at. But unfortunately, there's not enough always to distinguish between CF and asthma. So some people with CF will have some reversibility. We don't tend to do bronchial provocation testing, but obviously that is something you can do. But there's not currently enough evidence to tease out the difference between CF and asthma in that. Sorry. Um, Again, some other clues that you may see. So exercise testing, there's not uh, a particular way of, ch of working out how much is CF or how much is asthma at the moment, but there will be a further investigation looking at the role of exercise testing. Again, allergy testing, we often see that people with CF will be reactive, like the first case to uh, aspergillus. Um, there is a role, I believe, in really concentrating on looking at ATP to tease this out. But again, that role of distinguishing between asthma and CF can be very difficult. One thing that was quite useful in this case and that is quite widely available is, is looking at the exhaled nitric oxide level. Usually that will be low in people with cystic fibrosis. It may be high, as in Shelley's case, when people have eosinophilic asthma. But again, this needs further work to tease this out. So when we're looking at CF asthma overlap syndrome, what are the treatment goals? What are we trying to achieve? So we really need to try and switch off that inflammatory process. So for Shelley's case, this was done by the steroids. So we're trying to dampen down that inflammation. We're trying to control her symptoms of wheeze. So we're looking at effective bronchodilator for her. And we're trying to prevent her having further interruptions to her life with exacerbations or hospitalizations. And we would do that with a long-term inhaled corticosteroid and actually looking at how we can help her be adherent to that and also to her ETI therapy. So again, this slide, sorry, is very busy, but it's basically talking about all the inhalers that are available. Um, so we look at short-acting beta agonists. They're well used in cystic fibrosis. They're well used in asthma. Um, as are long-acting beta agonists, as are long-acting anti-muscarinics. I guess the key point I want to make with this slide is the inhaled corticosteroids. They're not actually recommended in cystic fibrosis unless you know you've got some asthma. So it's interesting, there's huge numbers. Certainly in our clinic, we're also guilty of it, of so many people being on inhaled corticosteroids. And there are potential side effects. Um, we need to be quite clear that what we're treating, I think would be my argument. Obviously, inhaled corticosteroids are the mainstay of lots of asthma treatment regimes. Um, so that little note uh, down about the equivocal, equivocal data for use um, and a little point to whether we are potentially overusing them in cystic fibrosis where there's no 
asthmatic component. And again, when we're looking at inhalers, it's really important to keep an eye on inhaler uses. Um, obviously, there's a huge cost burden. There's a huge burden of treatment. Um, and it's really important when we're choosing them that we've identified people really do need them. What are their preference? What type of inhaler do they want? And also, there's a global warming potential. So the HFCs, particularly in MDI inhalers, uh, contribute massively to global warming. So I think it's a bugbear of ours, certainly the NHS uh, in the UK is all about costs, but people need to be able to use the inhaler and it's really important to actually check how they're using an inhaler and perhaps not to give them different types of inhalers um, because we know that adherence and success will be lower. We've all probably heard of people squeezing inhalers onto cornflakes like aftershave. It, it happens, doesn't it? Um, and then at the bottom there on the right, the little sort of Venn diagram is looking at the burden of care for people. So what you can see there is Shelley is actually in that little white section of the 22.4%. She's actually got inhaled antibiotics to do. She's got DNAs to do. She's got hypertonic saline to do. And now we're giving her extra burdens of, of additional inhalers to do. Um, so you can see there that actually 80% of people in the UK are on one or more of those before we even start adding on anything else. And then what about airways clearance? Well, obviously really important. And we know from her case that she actually had mucus plugging on that CTPA that they were doing to look whether she had a pulmonary embolus. I think there's no real guidelines in CF asthma overlap syndrome of what we should be doing airways clearance wise. Obviously it should be completely personalized our physiotherapists in our centre had a look at the people that we have labelled with CF asthma overlap syndrome and what their main way of clearing their chest was. Uh, and their main way was exercise. So here, Shell is not a massive fan of exercise. Also, the uh, OPEP devices. So Shell has got an aerobica. And then obviously, people are taught AD as well. There isn't a real gold standard of measuring outcome for airways clearance in this group of people. I know there's lots of interest around future work of should we be doing lung clearance index? Should we be doing MRIs? Again, this is, I think, an emerging area. As regards to some of the other treatments, so the leukotriene antagonists of Singulair might be used. A key thing here is the use of systemic steroids. So oral steroids we do sometimes use in CF exacerbations if they're really severe. And we do use them in ABPA. I think the key is not to use them for long periods of time. And that is also what is recommended in asthma. For, so using steroids for a high dose for a short period of time and an exacerbation. Obviously, what we don't want is people maintained on long term steroids, which is where the role of all the biologics have come in. So there is good evidence in asthma about using biologics for set groups of people to reduce that long term steroid burden. This is also an emerging area in CF, actually. So there are case reports using it in people with ABPA who have CF. And there are now emerging reports in using it in CF asthma overlap syndrome. But again, there's lots of data left to be found in this arena. So I guess my take homes from this is uh, it's nice to look beyond CF. I think we are going to have lots of people who CF may be not their primary concern anymore. And this is a list of um, diagnoses from one of our people with CF. And you can see that CF actually comes halfway down the page of the list of diagnoses of this adult with cystic fibrosis. They've listed asthma above. Uh, they've talked about diabetes, sinus problems. So what's going to be the role of ETI therapy? Are we going to see an emergence in people learning about new symptoms? As I said before, there is no gold standard diagnostic test for this. It's that balance of looking at the history, looking at A to P, looking at a reversibility um, in obstructive airways, and then a call out to who really does need that inhaled corticosteroid, because there is a role for it. But do we have lots of people with CF who don't have asthmatic component and are they still on inhaled corticosteroids? The ABCD there is just simple care. So the A stands for assessment and assessing how severe somebody's asthma is and, and how it's affecting their quality of life. The B is for basic therapies. So physical therapy, so getting exercise, having a good inhaler technique, having a good BMI, having good adherence. The C there is, and, and sorry, not smoking or vaping, obviously in the B. Um, 
the C there is looking at comorbidities. So we know that sinus disease is really important. Things like gastroesophageal reflux, they feed into CF, but they also feed into asthma and asthma overlap syndrome. And I guess key thing there is really a shared decision making and a shared goal of what's important for people and to really shout on focusing on what the adherence. So for Shelley, adherence is going to be a huge problem uh, and we need to bear that in mind with the burden and what she's trying to do in, in life. That's it. Thank you very much and happy to do questions. We have a few questions that were submitted through the app. Um, Jamie, were biologics considered for your patient? Uh, we haven't considered them yet. She's actually responded really, really well to inhaled corticosteroids and taking her ETI. So I don't know how much of each. I suspect that her CF management and her mucus plugging have got a little bit better because of the ETI therapy and the inhaled corticosteroids and her being adherent. But yes, we, we would consider it um, had she not improved. There's an, another question. Can you explain why the bronchoprovocation isn't considered a diagnostic tool? I think there's there's quite a lot of overlap. We do use it in asthma, actually, so not for people with cystic fibrosis. So it is in that diagnostic workup that you can use for asthma. We haven't used it in any of our people with cystic fibrosis, although you obviously do see some almost daily in the clinics in CF when people are inhaling things. So you can see that they will may not tolerate things like inhaled antibiotics, um, which is part of the reason that we're doing the lung function pre and post starting those. But no, we don't, I don't know if other centers do, but we don't actually use that within CF. So even if you're trying to tease out whether they have asthma overlap syndrome? Yeah, we haven't right. done. Um, but again, I'm stand to be corrected I, I haven't seen any evidence of people using that and maybe that is something out there. there's another question um have you done a pre and post on this patient since the hospitalization sorry doing a pre and post a pre and post um pulmonary function testing yes yes she sorry has. yeah okay oh yeah she has been back to clinic since um, and so her lung function is sitting around 95, so it is up slightly. And again, it's difficult to tease out for that. How much is the role of the inhaled corticosteroid and how much is that she is now more adherent and her sweat chloride has dropped back into the 80s. So I, I do feel she is doing more of the ETI therapy. So and I think that kind of illustrates with the CF asthma overlap. There's so many different strands happening at the same time of, of how well people are managing their CF and the treatment of, of an asthma component. I'm going to ask one more question. Um, do you use uh, the asthma scoring tool at all with these patients? Embarrassingly, we do in an asthma clinic, but not with cystic fibrosis. And that's, again, where we need to get better at learning from what are happening in other clinics. Um, and I do think this is an emerging area. We were talking the other day about um, building relationships with other specialities. And interestingly, the difficult asthma clinic is in our hospital and we are building bridges more with them. So I think we are going to have more cross pollination of borrowing what other specialities are doing to improve what we do in cystic fibrosis. Great. And uh, just to let you know that all of our speakers will be hanging out for a few minutes at the end of this session. If you have any further questions. Thank you, Jamie. Brilliant. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Sam Alexu. She is currently an associate professor of clinical pediatrics at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine and an attending physician in the pediatric pulmonology at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. During her fellowship, she obtained a second and third year clinical fellowship grant from the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation to investigate the function of a promoter protein called ERP29 and its function as a regulator, or CFTR, and F508 DEL. She remains committed to treating patients with cystic fibrosis. Uh, her primary academic focus has been to care for patients requiring chronic mechanical ventilation, specifically those born prematurely and with congenital lung lesions. As a member of the Bronchopulmonary Dysplasia Collaborative, a multi-center group whose goal is to provide 
Innovative Care of Patients with Severe BPD. She is also the Associate Director of the Ch of Children's Hospital Philadelphia's Technology Dependence Center. She has the privilege of implementing various educational modules and fostering an environment of continuous improvement in the care of technology-dependent children. Her long-term academic goals include improving clinical care and determining ways in which clinicians can intervene to optimize lung function and improve developmental outcomes and quality of life in infants requiring chronic mechanical ventilation. Please welcome Sam. Good morning. Um, I have to say CF was really one of the reasons that I got into pulmonary medicine. And so while I do have a, a vested interest now in managing patients on chronic mechanical ventilation, being able to sort of do this and talk about both CF and BPD, I know it's going to be a good day. Or at least a good session. All right, so the title of my talk today is going to be A Tale of Two Chronic Lung Diseases, Clinical Challenges in a Patient with Cystic Fibrosis and BPD. I have nothing to disclose. And so we'll get right into the case. Um, so we are going to be talking about patient AC. She's a female. She was born at 31 weeks gestation at CHOP's special delivery unit due to a prenatal diagnosis of echogenic bowel. So this is a unit within our hospital where babies with prenatal diagnoses that require probably immediate attention after birth um, um, can be delivered at. The mother is a known CF carrier, so we knew prior to this that um, she was positive for Delta F508, um, and the father at the time um, was negative. There is positive consanguinity, um, parents are first degree relatives. Interestingly, there was a prior pregnancy history that was notable for two neonatal demises. One was suspected to be due to HLH, and the other we really had no idea. We didn't have any medical records from their home country in India, um, and so it kind of left a lot for us to, to question. CPAP was initiated in the delivery room for hypoxemia, but she was subsequently intubated for abdominal distension and tachypnea. Um, if you can see on the right, um, you can see a picture of her chest radiograph shortly after intubation. Um, and so it looks fairly well aerated. You don't really see any sort of opacities, maybe a little bit of atelectasis in that right lower lobe. However, we as pulmonologists blamed it on the neonatologist um, vent strategy because they were using ARDS vent strategies. And so they were using really low tidal volumes. Um, but for all my RTs in here who are interested in vent settings and pressures, she was really requiring only 15 to 17 centimeters of water pressure. Her PEEP was quite low at six and she was in room air. And so if you look at the blood gas, despite these low volumes that she was actually getting, um, her gas exchange was actually quite good. Um, she ended up undergoing an exploratory, um, exploratory laparotomy, um, and uh, the surgeons had found 30 centimeters of ischemic volvulized bowel with perforation. So the pulmonary team was consulted on day of life one for a CF workup, knowing the mom's um, carrier status and the prenatal diagnosis of echogenic bowel. At the time, she was actually doing fairly well. Again, she wasn't requiring a whole lot of respiratory support, um, but as is standard sort of practice um, at our institution, we did start albuterol and manual chest PT twice daily. On day of life five, her newborn screen um, returned. Um, her IRT was elevated and she was found to be Delta 508 homozygous. And so at this point, again, knowing that we've confirmed the diagnosis of CF and knowing that she was intubated and that this affects airway clearance, we decided to kind of up the, the frequency of airway clearance to every six hours. Um, we did start hypertonic saline um, as well as Dornase Alpha. And I know 3% is like, well, that's not really CF management. However, we really we tend to start low, especially in our neonates. Um, and then after a few days, we work them, we work them up to 7%. At one week of life, she had an acute decompensation following an MRI. So this was just really during transport. Um, and she was transitioned from a conventional ventilator to the oscillator. Um, because of this decompensation, um, she had a, a sepsis evaluation and her blood culture did come back positive for staph aureus, um, which was treated with vancomycin. Around this time, we started realizing that the secretion burden was actually increasing and the secretions um, were described as being just thick and white. If you look at the chest radiograph now that's updated, um, you can actually start, you can see bilateral upper lobe atelectasis. And if you pay really close attention, you'll start to see that in the lower lobes, the lucency is actually increasing. So we're starting to get a little bit worried about hyperinflation in areas that we don't want hyperinflation to exist. 
Um, at this point, we actually increased your airway clearance, sorry, I should say every four hours. Um, and at this point, we also considered a therapeutic bronchoscopy to try and remove some of the secretions that we felt were probably stuck in those upper lobes. However, she had a really small endotracheal tube. It was only 3.0. And so while we can go in and actually take a peek at what was going on, we wouldn't be able to suction and we wouldn't be able to do a lavage. At three weeks of life, she decided that she was done being intubated. She wanted something different. Um, and so she decided to just pull her ET tube out and hope for the best. Um, luckily, our neonatologist felt that, you know what, we'll give it a try. And so they supported her initially using CPAP 10. Um, and at that point, she was requiring about 30% oxygen. Over the first couple of days, they were actually able to lower the CPAP um, requirement down to nine and then to eight. Um, and I remember going to the bedside around that time, um, and I was just really under impressed with her lung exam. And I guess in this way, it's not really a good thing. I remember having to tap the head of my stethoscope because I couldn't hear breath sounds very well. And I actually started to hear some wheezing bilaterally. And you know when a pulmonologist taps on the stethoscope, it's not a good sign. Um, if you look at the blood gas five days after extubation, um, you see that she definitely has an elevation in her PCO2. But if you kind of compare that to what we see in our typical BPD patients, it looks the same, right? I mean, the pH is actually corrected. And so this kind of looks like just permissive hypercarbia. And so we thought, well, maybe she'll kind of get better. However, things kind of progressively worsened over time. And you can see the blood gas just before reintubation where she's um, acutely hypercarbic. Um, and so the decision was made to intubate her 10 days later for respiratory distress and lethargy. Around this time, she hit her 36 weeks postmenstrual age. Um, and so we know for people that do BPD that this is a critical time where we can actually diagnose and uh, BPD. And sure enough, because she was requiring positive pressure ventilation and she at this point was on 35% oxygen, she met criteria for severe BPD. Also, her secretions at this point were starting to um, get thick and they were starting to change color, noticed to be yellow and tan. We were finally able to upsize her tube to a three five. Actually, no, she did. I'm sorry. She underwent flexible bronchoscopy. Um, however, uh, we ended up having to do a non bronchoscopic, so a blind BAL again, because she did have a 3OET tube. Um, the bronchoscopist who performed the procedure noted that she had um, copious secretions and a lot of airway inflammation. Um, she underwent um, some cultures uh, and was found to be positive for MRSA. Um, and prior to this, I had mentioned that she also had a previous blood culture and was treated with vancomycin. The NICU team was having a really hard time clearing this infection. And so we ended up getting our ID colleagues involved. And so they recommended four weeks um, with ceteroline adaptomycin for persistent MRSA bacteremia. We decided that we needed to do something to really help kind of improve prove airway clearance. And as you can see, the chest x-rays are just progressively getting worse. Um, and so we decided that we were going to transiently transition her from a, a conventional ventilator to the VDR ventilator to improve secretion mobilization. But after about 24 hours, this was nixed and she was placed back on a conventional ventilator. I do think part of the part of this was because our NICU folks aren't as comfortable as our PICU colleagues in sort of managing the VDR. And so they've they just probably just put her back on the conventional ventilator because they were more comfortable with that. A chest CT was obtained so we can get a better picture of what was going on in the lungs. Um, and our ID colleagues had recommended a full body MRI to see if there was another source of infection. These are some um, CT images um, from that day. So if you look on the left on the coronal view, you can actually see her airways quite nicely. Um, however, the upper lobes bilaterally are completely, you know, or socked in. Um, you can see airway. So this is probably a combination of atelectasis and consolidation. Um, and so again, treating this as a true exacerbation. If you look at the actual, um, the axial image on the, on the right, you can see um, just, just the lucencies, um, simplified lung um, and some hyperinflation as well. Over the next couple of months, she did have multiple plug-in events just because the secretion burden was quite high. We finally were able to upsize her ET tube to a 3.5 and performed a, a good BIL, um, which yielded 100,000 colonies of Staph aureus and Klebsiella. And so she received two weeks of Bactrim at that point. 
chess PT wasn't cutting it for her. And I'm not sure about you guys in your institution, but I'm not completely convinced that we do a really great job of performing good, consistent chess PT on babies that are intubated. Um, and so we knew we had to sort of change gears and, and really think of something different. And so we did start IPV on her as well as using the cough assist device to aid in some secretion clearance, which actually helped and she tolerated it without trying to die on us. Um, after the two weeks of Bactrim were up, clinically, she seemed to be doing okay. However, when we looked at the vital sign trends, we noticed that her heart rate was starting to climb up and her respiratory rate was starting to climb up. And so at that point, we had a heart-to-heart -heart talk with our NICU and ID colleagues, and we begged for an additional week of Bactrim. She had received dark course courses during the hospitalization, um, but with that last week of Bactrim, we also advocated for starting her on a week-long course of methylprednisone to really try and reduce that inflammatory burden um, because we had, a, we had a feeling this was going to be our last shot at extubation before we started talking about um, tracheostomy tubes. Um, at the end of the course, we extubated her to bilevel support at around five months of age, and we eventually were able to wean her down to continuous CPAP. At that point, she was transferred over to our pulmonary floor where we continued a lot of the dispo planning for her. She was discharged home at eight months of age on CPAP via ram cannula during the day, and she used a nasal mask overnight. I know the use of continuous non-invasive support um, outpatient is kind of controversial, as is the use of a ram cannula to deliver CPAP, but we've actually had very good success doing it. Um, and so you can see here, people often think about the ram cannula as kind of being that small neonatal size, but in fact, there's different sizes and we could fit patients for a well-fitting you know, fitting, um, ram cannula to deliver adequate support for them. Um, she went home and over time she was slowly weaned off. However, she kept getting sick with different viruses. She had an older brother. And so every time she would come in, she would have to go back on support. Um, however, after the last admission, uh, we were finally able to kind of slowly get her off support. Um, her last admission was at 14 months of age, um, and she was officially liberated from respiratory support at around 22 months of age. So that was about a year ago. Um, and in that last year, she hasn't, she's had some minor colds, but again, none requiring um, respiratory support. So that's a win. And just to remind you guys, this is what her um, chest x-rays look like over time. So starting at one week on the left and then her most recent um, at 24 months um, on the right. And so you can see clearer lungs, um, really no opacities. I think overall clearly much better. And so clinical challenges and dilemmas. So something that's really great about our division is that we have a specialized BPD NICU consult group. And so this is a group of five or six um, primary attendings that will round on our NICU patients um, and those with severe BPD really to improve continuity. But something else that we do that's really great is that we meet every Wednesday to discuss challenging cases. And during her admission, we talked about her all the time. And some of the questions we would ask was, what are we treating? Is this CF or is this BPD? Why does she need respiratory support? Is it for CF or is it for BPD? Um, what's our primary goal here? And I knew I'd be following her outpatient. And so I had a vested interest in really preventing tracheostomy because I can't think of anything more challenging than having this nidus of infection in the airway in a patient with cystic fibrosis and expecting that we'll be able to decannulate her at some reasonable point in time. Um, we often asked ourselves if there was any vent strategies that we can do to minimize the risk of hyperinflation. We were really scared about that because Again, knowing you know our patients with BPD, they often have small airways, they're at risk for hyperinflation, knowing what that can do to the diaphragm and then their ability to trigger the vent, um, just because you're putting the diaphragms in a not so great place, um, we, we wanted to really try and minimize that. And then what other therapies could we have done to help reduce the secretion, the inflammatory and the microbial burden? We had discussions with um, our ID colleagues about um, using inhaled antibiotics, um, things like vancomycin or tobramycin. However, that was next. But I'd love to hear what you guys are, are doing at your institutions. And so why was this so challenging for us? Well, because there's so many overlapping symptoms of CF and BPD. From a respiratory perspective, these kids can often have persistent coughing. Um, they often have wheezing for different purposes, right? So kids with BPD um, often have small airway disease. Kids with CF, it's usually more central and due to just inflammation and secretions. Um, they can sometimes have difficulty breathing, increased respiratory rates. Um, they can often have recurrent infections. Um, kids with BPD, at least in the first two years of life, I mean, they're at risk for really coming back into the hospital for respiratory issues. Um, bronchiectasis is a concern, perhaps less so with BPD. 
Um, they can often require long-term respiratory support. Lung function abnormalities are known to occur. In the NICU, at least, there are nutritional challenges in patients with BPD, um, a slow weight gain and growth, and of course, that can lead to failure to thrive. And there's electrolyte disturbances. A lot of our kids with BPD are on diuretics, and that can often lead to the derangement. The lung microbiome in CF and BPD um, are also known to cause changes in lung function. In CF, uh, microbial diversity will decrease and vary with age, and this can affect lung function. There's an abundance of pseudomonas and staph in the lower respiratory tract. <clears throat> if you combine sort of this burden um, with lung function measures, it can also serve as, as indicators of just what their disease state is. In patients with BPD, uh, the infants who develop it will show reduced bacterial diversity in their airways at birth when you compare them to patients who did not develop BPD. Um, and there are actually significant differences in the composition of both airway microbiome and metabolome between severe, moderate, um, and mild BPD and those with non-BPD um, or it, and compared to those of non-BPD premature infants. Also, the abundance of stenotrophomonas increases with the severity of BPD, and we see that quite often. Um, so neutrophil elastase can also contribute to lung disease progression in both um, subgroups of patients. And so neutrophil elastase is an enzyme that's found primarily in neutrophils, and its role is to break down protein and in invading pathogens like bacteria. Um, it also can signal for your own white blood cells to come to a site of infection and kind of help with tissue repair. If it does its job too well, it can actually lead to inf an inflammatory process and tissue breakdown. Um, neutrophil elastase has been found in the airways of CF infants, um, and then free neutrophil elastase in sputum correlates inversely with FEV1 in children with CF. It can impair mucociliary function and innate immunity. Um, and then they had taken mice um, and instilled their um, instilled them with neut uh, neutrophil elastase during the saccular stage of development. So this is the age of around 24 to 26 to about 36 weeks gestation. So that's the point where surfactant starts being produced and when you'll see a lot of alveolarization. Um, and when they did that to mice at, during that period of time, um, it resulted in a BPD phenotype. Um, FEV1 trends are slightly different in patients with CF versus those um, uh, with kids with BPD. And so kids with, um, or people with CF um, will often start really high and then will kind of decrease about one or 2% every year. There's a significant exacerbation. It may be a little quicker, um, but it's typically a gradual decline. In kids with BPD, um, they'll actually start low. There'll be a little bit of catch-up growth. So let's, um, the red line is our patients with BPD. The, the blue is considered normal. Um, and so they'll start low. They'll catch up um, over the first couple of years. And then they'll reach their peak at around 25 years of age. And after that, they'll start to decline pretty gradually. However, because their peak was actually quite low, they start to show impairment fairly early on. And so this is kind of the population we're seeing now where they've developed like COPD or COPD-like symptoms. And so time will tell how this patient will, um, sort of how she'll fit into, into any of these um, categories or groups. And so in summary, um, CF and BPD show similarities in their presenting respiratory symptoms, nutritional challenges, and electrolyte disturbances. In both CF and BPD, the lung microbiome plays a role in disease progression and patient outcomes. Neutrophil elastase impairs mucociliary function and innate immunity and can lead to progression in both CF and BPD. A declining trend in FEV1 occurs later in life in the BPD population, but their starting point is lower than in patients with CF. And the importance of airway clearance regimen in patients with CF, especially those who are intubated, cannot be overlooked. And so I welcome any questions or comments or advice on things that you guys do differently that you think would have helped this patient. So the VDR is known for just being really good at like in, um, mobilizing secretions more centrally, more so than the JET is. Um, she didn't really have any signs of emphysema in the lungs, and so I think that's why they decided to just do the VDR. VDR uses different amplitudes with each breath, and so I think because of that, it does have an improved ability to, to clear the secretions. Yeah. So we started off with just doing the basic albuterol, the hypertonic saline, and the albuterol. When things started getting worse, that's when we added in the IPV. She was only on the VDR for about a day. And again, I think a lot of that is just comfort. And so the VDR is managed by the neonatologist. IPV is done by the respiratory therapist. And so I think they're much more comfortable managing the IPV and kind of knowing when it's really working or how to work it. Um, and so I think that's why it, it worked well for her kind of later stages of admission. 
So we have a few questions in the app. Um, do you often send BPD infants home on Ram cannula or was this a special case? Um, so we're doing it more and more. Um, and so really our goal is to get these kids home safely and as quickly as possible. And so we've actually been able to use Ram cannula even to deliver bi-level support really well. Um, and so I think we've had a, a lot of luck doing that um, and just preventing tracheostomy in a lot of these kids. And I can't think of a single case where we've done that and it actually had to bring the kid back for tracheostomy. So we've been quite lucky. So a concern that uh, we've had in our NICU is they currently go between nasal prongs and a nasal mask mm -hmm. every four hours. Mm -hmm. For a CF patient, are there are, is your facility doing anything in regards to the frequency of how often they change or replace those interfaces? Um, and how are they keeping them at the bedside? So in other words, they are taking it out. Are they just putting it in a cup at the bedside? I have some concerns about the infection mm. um, around those interfaces being interchanged and then just placed at the bedside without a recommendation for frequency of change or cleaning. So I don't know anything about the cleaning practices of the interfaces. I will say that when we typically transition between the interfaces, we'll use one during the day. So it can be 10 or 12 hours straight, and then we'll swap over to the nighttime interface again for the duration of time that they're asleep. We don't switch out every like four hours or as frequently as you might expect. And for the most part, we've had pretty good um, uh, results in terms of skin breakdown and things like that. And then... What has uh, been the treatment regimen since the patient's been home? So it's essentially been CF care. Um, and so because we've been able to wean her off support. So initially when she came into the, um, into the outpatient clinic the first time, I had my technology dependent team and the CF team. And so it was a very long visit. Um, however, we've gotten her off support and now it's pretty much just CF management. And so we're treating her with all the typical sort of respiratory treatments, airway clearance. Um, there really isn't a whole lot of like specific like BPD management. So she'll get her albuterol and chest PT twice a day. Um, she has her, her saline and her pulmazyme. Um, and then, of course, you'll increase it during periods of um, illness. But for the most part, it's really nothing sort of out of the ordinary. Does the family have a good understanding about the cleaning and disinfecting? Uh, I don't know if I've asked specifically about that. Um, why do you ask? I guess just because of the family history. Uh, uh, yeah. And then I just have one other. Um, so you were talking about the FEV1 changes in survivors of BPD mm -hmm. um, and that their baseline's lower. Yep. So given that she has cystic fibrosis and when she is eligible for modulators, yep. you see that that baseline will improve. improve or at least stabilize. Yeah. Um, and she's actually currently on Orcombe. So at one year of age, we started her on um, Orcombe. Um, my guess is because she was born at 31 weeks and not your typical sort of 24 weeker, that her baseline FEV1 will probably be higher than sort of the typical severe BPD population. Um, I don't know if she'll kind of get as high as to what we considered really normal. Um, and I'm hoping that the decline isn't going to be, be as like swift. Yeah. So hopefully her numbers look better. Any other questions? All right. We started in the hospital. I, can, I have to go back and see like at exactly what week, but it was fairly early on, probably within the first month. I don't know if everybody heard that, but the question was how early did they start um, Pulmazyme? Yeah. And we also considered IPV early on, um, but there were reports and we read a case study that it can cause pulmonary hemorrhage in kids that are under three and a half kilos. And so we said, you know what, we're not going to risk it. Um, and so that's why we waited until a little later to do it. All right. Thank cool. you for that Thank presentation. You. This is our last. Um, we have two speakers with this one. Uh, first is Marina Watson. She's a respiratory therapist from Wilmington, Delaware. She obtained her associate degree in respiratory therapy in 2020 from Delaware Technical Community College. She is currently working on getting her bachelor's degree in health science. She began her career as a staff respiratory therapist in 2020 at Nemours Children's Hospital, Wilmington, Delaware. And in 2022, she became the acute care lead and joined the hospital's inpatient cystic fibrosis task force, working very closely with CF patients and their families and caregivers, as uh, providing education to staff, students, and families, as well as working on initiatives to improve quality. And she's also uh, presented a few abstracts at the AARC Congress. 
And in 2021, she was presented with the Phil Award for providing exemplary care and treatment of her patients. And then also uh, we have Lauren Weaver. She received her master's of social work degree from Widener University in 2016. Additionally, she's received her certificate in cognitive behavioral therapy from Bryn Mawr College in 2021. Lauren currently works as a social worker at Nemours Children's Hospital in the Cystic Fibrosis Clinic in the Pulmonary Department. Lauren has worked with the CF team on many research initiatives related to psychosocial functioning. Lauren has recently uh, co-authored an article related to food insecurity and mental health screenings during the COVID-19 pandemic, which was published in the Journal of Pediatric Pulmonology. Please welcome Marina and Lauren. Thank you for having us today. Um, today we have a case presentation for you about two sisters and the impact of psychosocial barriers on CF lung health. I'm Marina Watson. Today, our objectives of our case presentation are to explore how psychosocial barriers impact respiratory status and to discuss interventions and resources that may contribute to clinical improvements. All right, I'm gonna start by giving some background information on our siblings. Sibling A is 13 month old female. Um, I'm sorry, this is at the time of their May clinic visit in 2023. Sibling A is a 13-month-old female with CF, uh, homozygous 508. They had positive cultures of MSSA. Baseline airway clearance included albuterol, BID, budesonide, pomazine. Um, and at that time, sibling A was on um, a liter and a half of oxygen. Her weight at that time was 20 pounds, 6.6 .6 ounces. And she had a follow-up visit scheduled um, at the end of July. Sibling B at that time was a three-month-old female um, with CF, also um, homozygous 508 with the same cultures. Her baseline airway clearance included albuterol, uh, pomazine. She had no oxygen, re oxygen requirements at that time, and her weight was 10 pounds, 5.8 ounces. Uh, she also had her follow-up visit scheduled at the end of July um, with a plan to have phone calls in between visits to help check on her weight and to problem solve anything that was going to go on that was going on at home. Some of the barriers to care um, for sibling A um, and B as of May 2023 included mom was unemployed at the time. Mom didn't have a driver's license or a car um, and had to rely on family for transportation. The patient's parents were fairly dysfunctional and had a, um, a rough relationship where there was a lot of fighting going on. There was a lack of community support from friends and family, and there was unaddressed um, mental health concerns for both parents. Some of the strengths of the family at that time included um, the siblings were brought to scheduled appointments and they came fairly regularly. Mom was a consistent communicator with the team through phone calls, so she did keep in touch with us. She was usually easy to reach um, and would return our calls fairly quickly. Um, the parents uh, and the CF team, we were working towards a more positive relationship. Um, early in sibling A's life, there was a lot of tension between the team, some mistrust, um, and I think stress over the original diagnosis, but we were working towards um, a better relationship. There was also a current open uh, child protective service case with that family that was unrelated to their medical needs at that time. Uh, police were contacted after parents were seen fighting. Um, there was some erratic driving, but they did have that protective factor in the home at that time. All right, our next slide is going to go over the presentation of sibling B to the, B to the hospital on 726, which was their scheduled follow-up appointment day. So their last reported weight for sibling B, who's the younger sibling here, was given by phone to our dietitian. It was reported to be 11 pounds, five ounces on 719, which was a weight gain, weight gain of 430 grams since her last clinic visit. I received a phone call that morning from the mom stating that the child did not look well, the family was bringing her into the emergency department, and this was a very frantic phone call. Um, so I alerted the medical team, the physician and I met the uh, mom, paternal grandmother at that time, and sibling B in the emergency room when they arrived. 
Upon arrival to the ED, sibling B was found to be in acute respiratory distress. Um, the medical teams quickly started working on her and shortly after Child Protective Services needed to be contacted when sibling B was moved uh, from the ED to the PICU. So just for a little bit of clarification and reminder, two siblings, sibling B is the younger one. We're gonna go back and forth, but sibling B was the sicker one. So we're gonna start with sibling B. She was also admitted first. Um, so on the day of presentation to the hospital on July 26th of last year, she presented to um, the ED emaciated. She was seven pounds, 15 ounces, spontaneously breathing on low flow oxygen. It is important to note that mom reported on 719 that sibling B weighed 11 pounds, five ounces, almost a four pound difference in a matter of days. Her breast sounds were poor, um, poor lung aeration and diminished on the right side. Her venous gas was a pH of 745 and CO2 of 75. Her SADS eventually dropped to 77. She was uh, nasally intubated due to respiratory failure and um, her chest x-ray is pictured um, and it was read as bilateral patchy airspace opacities greater on the left concerning for multifocal pneumonia or other etiology and a questionable left side, um, left sided pleural effusion. Okay, we're gonna hop back over to sibling A. Sibling A was brought to the ED that same day um, by Child Protective Services for a wellness check. She was crying, unable to calm her respiratory status. Uh, she was wheezing with some mild retractions, white patches on her tongue. She was diagnosed with oral thrush. Otherwise, she presented normally. There was no bruising, no signs of neglect or physical abuse. So she was discharged home, cleared by Child Protective Services and the medical team. She went home with mom with an RX for Nystatin and educational and proper bottle cleaning. Um, so hospital uh, mission for sibling B, she was obviously admitted while she was, sorry. Um, <laughs> she was obviously admitted while she was intubated. Um, uh, from July 26th to October 3rd, um, during her PICU admission, um, she was intubated and mechan mechanically ventilated. Her BAL was growing gram negative rods. Her viral COVID swab was negative. She had acute, uh, E. coli pneumonia, Klebsiella, oral thrush, and her airway clearance at the time was, um, every three hours, albuterol, metaneb, and then BID, pomazime, um, and budesonide. She also had a NG tube placed for feeding. Um, so these are pretty graphic pictures, um, but this is how she presented. Um, you can see her neck. Um, she had a rash, um, yeast infection on her neck. She had excessive breakdown of the skin around the neck, thought to be due to um, lack of hygiene. Um, her body was pale gray. I don't know if you can really tell with this um, on the screen, but she was very pale and gray. Um, she was bony, she was severely undernourished, she had abrasions, um, she was basically skin and bones, and it was determined that she was left in her car seat for extended periods of time, and there was hair loss on the back of her head and pressure wounds, which you will see on the next slide. Um, so this is her back. So the picture to your left is down her spine. Um, along her spine, she had pressure injuries, and then that is her bottom on the other picture. She had rashes, more pressure injuries, um, and this is all um, considered to be due to lack of um, hygiene. So this is her growth chart. When she was admitted, um, she was uh, 3.6 kilos, um, seven pounds, like we said. So that was that first, this is for her entirety, but that gray box is um, when she was admitted. Um, and then she was extubated on August 2nd to high flow nasal cannula, transitioned to floor care two days later on the 4th. She eventually was um, placed on a quarter liter nasal cannula. Her airway clearance was spaced out to every four hours. Her albuterol, uh, she was getting albuterol, chest PT, and then same thing, pomazime and budesonide, BID, and her NG tube was still in place. Her weight does eventually trend upwards and she had other needs um, due to her loss of muscle tone. She needed um, physical therapy. She needed speech therapy and occupational therapy. Um, we 
had uh, physical therapy in place to get her stronger so we can eventually transition her to um, the vest therapy. And she was eventually discharged on October 3rd. This is her weight change on um, discharge. So she gained about six pounds during her three month stay in the hospital. I'm gonna give a little bit of an overview of the psychosocial perspectives her sibling be during her hospitalization. So on July 26th, that initial day uh, presentation to the ED, a report for neglect was filed with um, Delaware's Child Protective Service Agency. On July 27th, uh, CPS indicated that sibling B can have no visitors other than CPS and law enforcement. On July 28th, the visitation restriction was updated by CPS. Mom could visit with CPS approved supervisors present. Um, those were identified as some family members that were cleared to supervise mom's visits. Maternal grandmother at that time became involved in the sibling's care. And prior to that, maternal grandmother was not involved due to the relationship between mom and her mom. Uh, maternal grandmother didn't have a lot of knowledge about CF and really didn't know the extent of the children's um, illness. A protection, the protection order against the children's father had been discontinued at that time. That was in place from that earlier event where um, Child Protective Services was involved back in May. So now dad was allowed to visit, but he was also um, under supervision. On September 13th, the maternal grandmother was granted guardianship of both siblings. The guardianship of the siblings indicated that maternal grandmother was able to make all medical decisions for the siblings um, and supervised visitation with parents would be at her discretion. Parents have not had any supervised contact, un unsupervised contact with either sibling since that time. Discharge education for sibling B began with um, the guardian and for an anticipated discharge at the end of September, which was then extended. Um, education requirements for maternal grandmother included manual chest PT, oxygen use, medication administration, and scheduled breathing treatments. And she was then discharged um, on October 3rd to her grandmother. So we're gonna transition back to sibling A. Um, of note, all of this was before grandmother obtained custody of siblings. Um, and sibling A was admitted two weeks after sister, sibling B, um, was admitted and was being cared for at home by mom during those two weeks. Um, so she was admitted to the hospital on August 16th um, and discharged on September 18th. Her ED presentation, she was tachypnic. She had desaturations, increased work of breathing. She was on a two liter um, oxygen via nasal cannula. Her chest X-ray um, was read as multifocal pneumonia, and she also had some edema. Um, during her admission, she was placed on high-flow nasal cannula due to her tachypnea and worsening edema. She had a full cardiac workup uh, completed, investigating pulmonary hypertension. Um, her airway clearance at the time was every three hours albuterol, vest treatment, and then BID, pulmozyme, and budesonide. Um, Lasix was also started, and at, at one point she was transferred to the PICU due to her increasing oxygen needs and respiratory support. Um, this is sibling A's growth chart on admission. So there she, you can see she was 9.48 kilos um, and she was 16 months and two weeks. Um, her CF uh, throat culture was, um, had, she had MSSA. Um, she was eventually transferred back to floor care on the 18th of uh, August, and she also had additional therapies of occupational and physical therapy, and then she was discharged in September, um, on September 18th, um, into grandmother's care. On discharge, this is her um, growth. So she, at, at discharge, she was 24 pounds, so she gained four pounds, um, and she had been there for um, exactly a month. A little review of sibling A's from a psychosocial perspective. Um, so as you'll remember, she was evaluated in the ED on July 26 when her sister was admitted. Um, and based on the findings, she was able to go home with her mom that day. Um, she was admitted, she was readmitted on August 16th due to the respiratory distress. Throughout the admission, parents visited period periodically with guidance from DFS and supervised um, visits. During the admission, she uh, grand maternal grandmother also got guardianship of this child as well. So 
looked very similar to the um, situation with her sister. And I wanna review the implemented interventions and resources for this family. Um, so there was the Child Protective Service referral. There was an investigation and a treatment plan opened for them. There was a change in legal guardianship. Both girls are now cared for by their maternal grandmother um, and some associated family in that household. We made a referral to medical daycare and they regularly attend medical daycare, um, which is a child care facility that's staffed with nurses so that they can get their treatments there, medication there, and are very closely monitored. They have some home nursing coverage for overnights that allow parents to sleep or a grandparent to sleep so that um, they can work during the day. Referrals were made to Behavioral Health Center for diagnosis and treatment. This was specifically for sibling A, um, and this was due to uh, collaboration with our inpatient team. She was inpatient for a really long time, and we realized that she was missing some developmental milestones and was having um, some very stressful reactions to the hospitalization. But with that diagnosis and treatment, she is improving. There was also a G2 place for sibling B. and a uh, review of the uh, um, results from the implemented interventions. So there was an increase in inheritance to, with the treatment protocol. Uh, this resulted in a good weight gain for both siblings. There was a decrease in the number of hospitalizations since October of 2023. Uh, they were admitted three more times emergency, emergently for both siblings. Uh, sibling A, B was admitted electively in January 2024 for her G2 placement. Since 2024, neither sibling has been admitted. So um, I love this slide um, because this shows the um, growth chart for sibling B, which was the sicker sibling. Um, it Her uh, weight um, went from being 3.8, 3.6 kilos up to um, now she's 7.7. .7, so she had a little drop, but she's still staying up there. But this is her most recent chest x-ray. Um, you can see a little bit of atelectasis in her left lower, but otherwise much improved. And you can also see the weight gain in her chunky little face um, around her chin at the top. So I thought that was really cute. And then sibling A's current growth chart um, and chest x-ray. So she went from um, 9.4 up to 12 kilos. Um, and then her chest x-ray um, was February 8th, um, and she had chronic atelectasis in her right lower, but otherwise no new findings. And this is a slide I'm very happy to share with you all their updates from their last clinic appointment in June. This was um, a really rough case for our team. So sibling A is now two years old. She's on Trikafta. Current weight is 27 pounds. She remains in the guardianship of her maternal grandmother and has very limited visitation with her biological parents. She received a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder in March 2024, and she's active, actively receiving therapy for that. That was based on that partnership with our inpatient team. She attends nurses and kids daily, receives OT and PT while she's there, um, and she's established a really strong bond with her primary caregivers, being her uh, maternal grandmother. Sibling B is 17 month old female. She's on our Canby. Current weight is 16 pounds, 15.1 ounces. She remains in the guardianship of her maternal grandmother, also has very limited visitation with bio parents. She has no more oxygen use, also attending nurses and kids daily, which is the medical daycare, receives OT, PT, and speech therapy. She's established a very strong bond with her caregiver and she continues to receive overnight nursing. Um, and now with the permission of her, Guardian, we do have a current picture of them to share. They're so cute. <laughs> They're both doing very well and thriving. Thank, Thank you, guys. You. It's a question for you, ladies. Um, you mentioned that at the medical daycare, there were services such as PT, speech, OT. Why no RT? Why no respiratory therapist in the medical daycare? And then can you back that up a little bit and give an overview of what medical daycare is? Because that's the first I've heard of that. So um, I'll be honest, I'm not sure that I can answer why there is not specifically respiratory therapy there, although I do know that they are doing their respiratory treatments while they are at uh, nurses and kids, the medical daycare. 
Um, our care team has a really close relationship with the two medical daycares in our state of Delaware. And we they consistently communicate with us and can send us reports, vest settings, um, reports of how often the vest is being used at home, things like that. Um, I'll review the medical daycare is a daycare facility where they're getting um, kids are getting traditional daycare schooling too. So there's programming, there's teachers there, but it's also staffed with nurses who are doing the round the clock care for G tube feeds, for um, tracheostomies, airway clearance, and um, they have their um, occupational therapists there that are providing treatment as well. The, the full um, full service program there, it's really wonderful. And sibling B had so, she was so hypotonic after that admission. Um, when she went to medical daycare, we had a physical therapist who used to work in our organization who kept in touch with our team, letting us know the weaknesses and the strengths or gains that she's had while she's in medical daycare. And it's huge. She would put no weight on her feet at all. She would pull her legs up and not put her feet down, which was not obviously a natural developmental um, instinct for a baby of her age. So they've made a lot. She's now on a stander. Um, and so they're really working on her getting some strength in her hips and her legs. Uh, it's just that medical daycare has been a huge asset to this family. And the improvements we've seen, you saw in the picture, those girls did not look like that just probably eight, 10 months ago. Um, so the maternal grandmother has done an amazing job with these girls. And I kind of believe some of the early admissions into 2024 could have been just her insecurities of how well they she thought they were doing. Um, so she's got a, a lot more confidence in their care now. Yeah, I think it's important to note that at that time she was new to CF. She was unaware of the girl's diagnosis before then and was coming into a, a really complicated care plan. And she really rose to the occasion and takes excellent care of these girls. Anybody have any further questions? For Marina and Lauren. Okay, first off, ladies, um, thank you for this presentation. Uh, this is, wow. I mean, I feel like I've got some trauma listening to your story, so I can't imagine how your team did. Um, that's actually my first question is, as a team, how did you guys uh, process this experience? There was a constant flow of support through all of our team members. Um, where I can't say enough good things about our team. Um, the day of presentation for sibling B to the hospital, the physician and I both went down to see the family. Um, so we were able to support one another. It was it was a horrific sight down there. Um, but I think through continued like supervision, our weekly meetings, we we function really well as a team and just supported each other. I think that also from I was there when she was brought into the ICU and. She looked really bad. Um, and I think at Nemours, we have uh, pastoral care who comes to bedside in any of those critical ill situations. And they're very, very supportive and for any of these traumatic situations so that we can talk and kind of get things off our chest. And uh, and they're there like for comfort and things like that. Um, so and like Lauren said, with the team, everybody that is on the CF team, they're very everybody's very supportive, too. Um. You guys had multiple touches with uh, DCFS. Um, can either of you highlight, because I don't know how many folks in this room have had to be a part of a situation like this. Can you highlight what your, um, what the expectation was for you guys to document and your contacts and how you had to interact with DCFS to be advocates for these young ladies? Yeah, I'm happy to review that because um, it this case was without was not without frustrations with working with the state, who is often very overworked. They have a lot of cases, and in cases of medical neglect, it's almost sometimes it's really hard to tease out. So you'll remember that uh, Child Protective Services was involved in May um, after our last visit. So it was presumed that there was a caseworker in the home checking on the children, working with the family. Um, but that caseworker may not have been as um, educated on what like uh, appropriate milestones are for a child of that age. So they're looking at her in her car seat with her clothes on, not necessarily seeing the decomposition of what's going on. The family was super stressed at that point um, and was getting so overwhelmed. 
but documentation was key to this case. So we were documenting all the phone calls, all the reported weights, all the resources that the family had at home prior to that initial um, presentation to the ED of that panic phone call. So um, Child Protective Services were seeing all of that communication that was going on um, and really helped to transition the guardianship because that was the sticking point of do, do these children remain with their biological parents or do they we need to switch guardianship? Um, and that was what was presented to the family. They could either electively opt to transition to kinship care, which is another family member taking over, or we would have to look for foster care placement. Luckily for these girls, their um, grandmother was more than willing to participate in care, but hadn't been up until that point because of a relationship between mom and grandma. Um, but we were actively involved with Child Protective Services throughout the admission. They really guided us on like who could visit, when they could visit, what the supervision restrictions were, and we were appreciative of that help. Don and Marina, what did you guys have to do? As far as the, so um, for, I work closely with Marina. She's my inpatient counterpart as me being the outpatient RT. And it was the same. Um, we asked our RTs to document um, the involvement with the family when they were in the room, any education that was done at the bedside, uh, how they received that education. Sound like joint commission. Um, you know, the the skills that they were learning, uh, interestingly enough, the paternal grandmother was supposed to be a second caregiver. She is a second caregiver. Uh, she was very disengaged. Um, it, it We struggle with, and the maternal grandmother struggles with, the girls go in with her. Am I allowed to say that? Um, but as RTs, we just documented, communicated in multidisciplinary rounds. We shared um, and, you know, we, again, had a lot of support as a multidisciplinary team through this whole situation. It was tough. These girls had a lot of foster moms in the hospital um, and anybody was, we just took them, those girls, and just loved on them and provided the best care we could, all of us, all as a multidisciplinary team. Thank you for sharing. I mean, obviously, this sweet little face of uh, <laughs> excitement over fruit snacks. Um, it, it just gives uh, us a good understanding of how well cared for they are now. But uh, that can be a drain, man. That that's a hard situation, and it's a situation, especially as an RT. Dude, we didn't cover what do you do when you have to interface with DFS or um, what happens when you need to testify in court. So um, kudos to you ladies for uh, bringing this to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Aaron Chittical, the, the program director, partner <laughs> with these guys. Awesome. Uh, this was really uh, an amazing team effort, both uh, medically and quote unquote, the biopsychosocial model here and um, a real tribute to the, to the strength and grit of the entire team and really the hospital system, I think, to get behind us as a team on behalf of this family. We thought this was a great presentation because it's rarely um, shared the psychosocial aspects and the impact on their overall care. So, um, we thought this was a perfect example of how how much there of an impact there is and then how as a community we rallied around this family and got them to where they are today. Hi, I'm Marie. I'm from Geisinger in Danville, Pennsylvania, and they are adorable, adorable. Um, I just wanted to say we have a very good medical daycare, um, kind of affiliated with our hospital. And we also have multiple families that could benefit from this with our CF kids. Unfortunately, we can only send one. Um, does your facility have anything in place for infection prevention control for multiple CF kids at the daycare? Uh, there are. The um, medical daycares in our state, like I said, work really closely with us. We have a really good relationship with the two of them. Um, and their requirements um, is one patient with CF per age group classroom. So we're able to have a couple kids at each center um, as long as they are not in the same classroom. Um, and there is really good infection control there. 
I think Don could probably speak. Yeah, to it's a our medical daycare is huge. The one that's in our um, biggest county. So it's rather large. So they're able to really segregate those kids from each other. Um, and they have done an amazing job making sure that there's no real interaction except with the siblings. We have actually two families that have uh, two children in the medical daycare that have C. Any other questions? All right. Thank you so much for attending. Everybody in the room, online, thank you to our speakers.